This episode of Epicenter is brought to you by Valtoro, the gold hedging platform for the crypto community. Trade gold to Bitcoin instantly and securely starting at just one milligram. Go to valtoro.gold slash epicenter to get early access to their V2 platform and to start trading. And by Cosmos. Cosmos is building the Internet of Blockchains, an ecosystem where thousands of blockchains can interoperate, creating the foundation for a new token economy. If you have an idea for a dApp, visit cosmos.network slash epicenter to learn more and to get in touch with the Cosmos team. Hi, welcome to Epicenter. My name is Sebastian Couture. And my name is Friederike Ernst. So today we're speaking with Tal Mohan. Tal is the uh, chief scientist at Space Mesh, and he's also a professor of computer science at the Interdisciplinary Center in Herzliya in uh, Israel. And you know, Space Mesh is a project that's been on my mind for a while because I met one of the co-founders at DabCon last year, and he was so excited because he's a big fan of the podcast. And, um, you know, just like, obviously wanted to be on the show and everything, or wanted Space Mesh to be on the show. And, you know, it was, it was really early at that time. They were just kind of starting to, you know, put the ideas together. But since then, it has, you know, transformed into a project that soon will be on testnet. And um, is actually really interesting because it proposes a new way to do consensus that uh, addresses a lot of the issues that people see in proof of work and also in proof of stake. Um, so we talked to Tal about a lot of the technical intricacies of their proof of space time uh, protocol. And uh, yeah, what, what did you think, Vilega? I thought it was uh, really interesting how he brings together this proof of space time, which in and of itself is not completely new, um, with um, this uh, directed acyclic graph topology. Um, and I thought it, it it makes for a super interesting project. And I am not surprised at all that they attracted um, massive investments by the top tier venture capital funds in this space earlier this year. Yeah, also, they just have a really impressive team of like super smart academic cryptographers that are making this happen. I think that a good complimentary to the show uh, is a talk that Tal gave at uh, San Francisco Blockchain Week in November. That talk will be in the show notes um, because if you're like me and you're more of a visual person, you might want to uh, look at the uh, slides uh, that uh, he uses to, to sort of uh, this, describe uh, the protocol and how it works. Um, other thing to mention is uh, this week, uh, uh, we are in Berlin and we are at the Cosmos uh, Interchain Conversations event. So that is happening on the 13th and 14th. And we've been mentioning this for a couple of weeks. Now, let me just give you links for that. So um, if you want to sign up, uh, because there's still time as this is being released to sign up uh, to the Interchain Conversations event uh, happening at full node. You can go to epicenter.rocks slash interchain Berlin. And if you use the code epicenter, you'll get $65 off the uh, tickets. Um, if there are still places left on that discount code, because I believe we had some limited, limited access codes there. And then there's a hackathon happening on the weekend. So on the 15th and 16th, again, at full node, uh, Cosmos Hackathon. So if you want to work on a project and you have an idea and you want to come build at the hackathon, uh, to sign up, go to epicenter.rocks slash Cosmos Hackathon Berlin. All those links and details will be in the show notes. So without further delay, here's our interview with Tal Moran. Hi, so we're here with Tal Moran. Tal is the uh, chief scientist at Space Mesh. He is also a professor of computer science at the Inter Interdisciplinary Center of Hetzilia in um, Israel. And he joins us today from Israel to talk about Space Mesh and a new form of consensus mechanism that we'll learn all about in this episode. Thanks for joining us, Tal. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. So tell us a bit about your background. And so you, you come from academia. How did you come into the blockchain space? I am an academic cryptographer by training. And I was always interested in sort of protocols that have like new ideas and and uh, potentially practical uses. And uh, basically, I started working a few years ago. I, I heard about, uh, you know, Bitcoin. And I have to say, in the beginning, it didn't sound, you know, I didn't understand what the excitement was about. But once I started looking at the protocol, 
then you know, there's some really nice, interesting theoretical questions there. And this is how I got started. Uh, you know, how, how to solve the, the problems, the theory that come out of Bitcoin. So you did a PhD with uh, Moni Nawa, who also worked on eCash with uh, David Chum. Um, so what was your PhD on? So my PhD was, uh, you know, it was fairly wide ranging, but I think some of the more interesting parts, uh, definitely to a lay audience, are uh, protocols that uh, people can do. Uh, I think my thesis was called cryptography uh, by the people for the people. Um, so things like uh, voting protocols where you want to you know, make sure that your vote was counted but still keep the vote secret. And on the other hand, you don't trust computers. So what can you do? Um, so these are also actually things that are based on some really, really nice ideas uh, by David Schaum um, that we you know, extended. We have you know, uh, several papers on that in that area. Um, and also things like how you can use sort of everyday objects to do cryptographic protocols. Like you know, we had cryptographic protocols with scratch off cards um, and things like that. You studied in your PhD exists in sort of the real world or like in yeah, so, uh, so actually practical, the, practical applications? The voting protocols, are people are actually trying to put these into practice. And there are several different ones. Uh, there was actually a project that uh, they did at the IDC called Wombat Voting. Um, that had a cryptographic verification. There are bigger projects. Uh, David Chaum was involved in one in uh, Maryland, and uh, I think Tacoma Park, I don't remember the exact name, where they actually did like a citywide uh, election using verifiable voting. So, so people are working on these things. And I think now that, you know, voting fraud and, and you know, attacks on the voting system have become more... Uh, <laughs> You know, talked about, then these things might have a resurgence. And what about your postdoc at Harvard? Can you tell us a bit about that? Uh, yeah, so I, I worked with uh, Salil Vadhan there. And uh, actually, some of the things that we did there with the, say, we, we had the first protocol for proof of sequential work um, when it still wasn't fashionable. Uh, so we, we came up with the protocol. This is together with uh, Mohammed Mahmoudi. Um, and it was a very complicated protocol, I have to say. It was not really practical. Uh, but uh, last year, um, Bram Cohen and uh, Christoph Pechak uh, actually have a much, much uh, simpler version of this protocol that uh, won the best paper award at Eurocrypt. Um, and this is what a protocol we're actually using in Space Mesh. Ah, super interesting. Um, Bram Cohen, he's also in. Uh, involved with um, Chia coin, right? So uh, uh, maybe we'll is, talk about this. And also Christoph, uh, they're they're both okay. uh, involved. Okay. Ah, we'll, maybe we'll talk about this. Uh, um, maybe we'll talk about this for a bit later. Um, so, but uh, you've been uh, for a couple of years. You've been a professor, uh, professor in Herzliya, um, and you've uh, started working on space mesh there. Correct. Yes, that's correct. So I actually started an earlier uh, cryptocurrency first called uh, MeshCash, which had uh, many of the same ideas, but it was based on uh, proofs of work. And uh, you know the, the original motivation was always to try to replace proofs of work with something else. But you know the, there's just a lot of, of uh, details there. And proofs of work have this one giant advantage is cryptographically, they're very easy to work with. And they have like... They're self-contained. They're, they really are very nice in terms of uh, you know, proving their security. Um, so the first version said, let's you know, do things one step at a time. The first version just uh, took the first step of solving you know, the scalability problems and uh, some of the incentive compatibility problems that uh, you know, these blockchain protocols have by going from a chain to a mesh. Mm -hmm. um, and then... Uh, the second step was taking the ideas from MeshCache and replacing the proofs of work with proof of space time, which is basically replacing the resource that I'm using. Instead of CPU, I'm going to use disk space. And this adds a lot of challenges in terms of how we get things to stay secure and guarantee consensus. Um, and that's what we solved, basically, when we wrote Space Mesh. Really interesting. Um, so maybe let's talk about um, the the proof of work and proof of stake and proof of space time part first, and then we can move on to the to the mesh part. Is that okay with you? Uh, sure. Yes. Fantastic. So, I mean, there there are different issues with proof of work. One being that it's extremely energy 
um, intensive. Um, but you also feel that there are that proof of stake doesn't um, isn't a worthy successor or isn't a good successor for many causes. Why why, why do you think that is? Yeah. So. I, I wouldn't say that I'm like categorically against proof of stake. I think there's some very nice protocols that use proof of stake, but proof of stake does have some major disadvantages compared to proof of work. Um, so one of them is this uh, sort of uh, circularity, right? When proof of work is totally self-contained. I have a resource. I prove to you that I use the resource. In proof of stake, I'm proving that I used that I spent money that's in the system. But first of all, there's a circularity because this is actually a resource only if the money is worth something. But the money is only worth something if the system is secure. So we have something that seems a little bit fishy. Um, it doesn't mean that it's, you know, it can't work in practice, but it already, you know, it's like the, the foundations are a little bit shaky. Um, the second thing is because you have the, the, the whole system sort of you know, certifies itself, then you have these problems with uh, how you prove security or basically what your security assumptions are. So again, here I'm talking about things that actually prove security, which maybe we'll talk a little bit later why I think that's a critical uh, thing to do when, when you're um, designing cryptocurrency protocols. But um, in proof of stake, if you want to prevent this uh, sort of alternate history attack where Suppose I wake up now after 100 years and I'm trying to find out what the current history is of the system, right? Then if I have a proof of work, then there's an easy solution. I can see what how much work has been spent on sort of each branch of the, of the system and now I know what's the, the true history. But in proof of stake, if say somebody manages to steal old keys, so some, somebody manages to steal um, you know, all of the keys at some a uh, very uh, far back point in time. And then they can now fork the system and create a new history that looks completely valid because the history only depends on, you know, who has which keys. And so this they can sort of fast forward this history to the current day. And now I have two histories that I simply cannot distinguish between. And so I have to trust somebody. And this is a problem when what you want is a sort of totally decentralized and, you know, the, the Trust should also be decentralized. And the way they solve this in, in the proofs of, of proof of stake, they either need to add these trust assumptions like checkpoints, like, okay, you know, we just know that you know, at this point in time, this was the right branch and we just will never switch to another branch. Um, or uh, stronger assumptions like the, uh, things like you can erase your, your memory securely, right? So if, if I, the honest users always completely delete their old keys and switch keys all the time, so nobody can steal them after the fact, then this can help you prove security of such a system. But these security erasure um, assumptions are arguably you know, not so reasonable and because it's very hard to actually securely erase data. And honest users, it's not clear that they have an incentive to erase data because you cannot prove that you erased it. So you know, we have security assumptions that are more iffy, and then there's the final thing, which is this uh, sort of permissionless uh, property, right? So one nice thing about proof of work is I can start doing a proof of work without asking anybody for permission. I just, you know, start my CPU and it works. In a proof of stake system, in order to join the system, I have to get stake. And I can only get stake if somebody gives me stake. So I need somebody's permission to give me stake. So you can say, okay, this is just a technical, you know, definitional property. But it's actually not completely technical because there is an attack that's related to this. Suppose the adversary somehow manages to get a majority of the stake at some point in time. It has 51% of the total stake in the system. It can now refuse to sell the stake to anyone. And from now on till forever, basically, the adversary controls a majority of the stake. And this is a problem, especially when systems are starting up, because systems, you know, say if, if the economy is worth uh, $100 trillion, getting 51% of the stake is a very expensive attack. But if the economy starts now and it's just worth, you know, $10 million or $50 million, then getting 51% of the stake might not be such an unreasonable attack, especially if you're talking about things that might be of interest to sort of nation state level actors. 
The, the other problem is that this is undetectable. So the fact that I have 51% of the stake, it doesn't appear on the blockchain as, you know, Tal has 51% of the stake. I can pretend to be many different people and they can still sell to each other. So you don't see this like giant block of stake staying there. It looks like the system is fine, but at any point in the future now, I can decide to crash the system, right? So, so this is something, again, is this an actual reasonable attack? I'm not sure, but I, I think it's enough of a worry that I wouldn't want, say, all of the world's economy to be based just on a proof of stake system. Interesting. I, I, I had sort of heard of these uh, attack vectors before, uh, specifically this last one. But the other two, so the, the trust assumptions that you have to make around checkpoints. So you mentioned that in order for this to work, one would have to steal basically all the keys from a particular point in the past and then. So this, this is like the worst it. case attack, right? right. There are you know, weaker attacks that don't steal all the keys. That, there are various. Like, this is like an example of something that you you could do. That in order to prevent this, you'd need, you know, some stronger assumption. Okay, but how how likely do you think this attack is from? Happening? I don't know. Like, okay. I don't know. Um, and you know, it might not be that likely. But part of the thing is that these are things that are very hard to quantify. And you know, if you're basing your economy on it, I'd like not to have all my eggs in one basket. That's understandable. I'm, I'm much more confident, say, about mathematical assumptions, such as, you know, it's hard to find a collision in SHA-256 than in this kind of assumption about how people behave when the system is starting, because we have much less understanding of, of these types of things. If you're holding a significant portion of your net worth in crypto, you're probably waiting for your portfolio to moon at any time. But holding crypto doesn't mean you should be irresponsible in the face of volatility risk. That's where Voltoro comes in. Voltoro is the leading gold hedging solution for the crypto community. And as a stable asset trusted for millennia, gold is the perfect long-term hedging solution. And at Epicenter, we've been using Voltoro since 2014 to protect a portion of our company's assets against volatility. Now, you might ask, why not use a stablecoin, Seb? Which is a great point. And don't get me wrong, stablecoins are great and a real benefit for crypto adoption. But algorithmic stablecoins are still a very new and experimental asset type. And some asset-backed stablecoins have been scrutinized for being under-reserved. With Voltoro, your gold is 100% insured and secured in vaults deep in the Swiss mountains protected by Brinks. Every single gram of gold is audited and holdings are made transparently available on their website for anyone to verify. And most importantly, it's quite literally your gold. You can choose to have it delivered to you at any time. To learn more and to get access to Voltoro's brand new V2 platform, which includes an interface overhaul and trading in Dash, Litecoin, Ether, and Silver, Go to volturo.gold slash epicenter. That's V-A-U-L-T-O-R-O dot gold slash epicenter. We'd like to thank Volturo for their support of the podcast. So what you posit as a new mechanism is the proof of space time. Uh, can you explain what that is? Yes. Yeah, so a proof of space time is basically a real physical resource. Um, ideally, what you're be going to be using is disk space. So I'm going to be sort of filling up my disk and then not using it for anything else for a period of time. So, and the, the time here is important because you, you think of, say, if I want to rent disk space, right? I pay by megabyte per month, not just by megabyte. So it's not enough to say that, you know, I have this much space because if I can reuse this space again and again in short periods of time, then in some sense, my resource is not limited. So I, I want it to store space over time. Unfortunately, we can't quite prove that that's what you're doing. So formally, what we're actually proving is that either I'm storing space over time or I'm doing a lot of work, of CPU work. So why isn't this just a proof of work? It's because in terms of incentives, it's actually a lot cheaper to store than it is to do the CPU work. And we, we ensure that's true by making the CPU work, CPU work sort of hard enough so that it always is cheaper. And if somehow storage becomes more expensive, then we just make the CPU work more expensive. Um, and so honest parties will always just uh, store the data because, you know, it costs you one cent to store things, but it'll cost you two dollars to recreate it. Um, and the adversary, you know, our assumption about the resources is that this combination of know, CPU plus uh, disk space is still a minority. So in the white paper, I believe it's the white paper, or at least one, one of the places where you describe Space Mesh, um, it 
it, it, it talks about the assumption that it is unprofitable for a participant to sort of mine blocks uh, on like a cloud instance or on even a dedicated computer at home and that one can only be profitable if they're using it on a computer that's being used for other things, presumably. Why is that? Yeah, I, I'm, I'm not sure. Okay, if, if the statement is it's not profitable, that's a bit too strong. I think the word is used unprofitable. Yeah, okay. So so maybe we should be more precise. We can't guarantee that it's not profitable, right? Because profitable or not will depend on you know what the price of the currency is and how fast it goes up and all sorts of things that we can't control. And they depend on all these economic factors that like they're not part of the technical design or the parameters of the protocol. What we hope... Right? The, the way the protocol is designed is that it should still be profitable for you to do this if you have a home computer and disk that you already own for a different reason. Right? So if you, we're talking about marginal cost, right? buying a disk for a home user uh, is maybe actually higher cost than buying a disk for uh, somebody like Amazon or Google or like some a large whale who can have economies of scale and buy disks more cheaply. Um, and, and this is you know, the, the, re, the, the standard thing. So in any type of resource, usually if you have economies of scale, it, it gets cheaper as, as you get more per resource. However, if you already have a disk for another reason, and here we're using the fact that a lot of people already have disks. So for instance, I have already for other reasons, way before I started Space Mesh, a fairly strong computer, that's always connected to the internet and it has you know, four terabytes of disk and I probably use two terabytes, right? And there are two terabytes there because when I bought the disk, you know, I didn't know how much I'd need. And I think a lot of people are in the same situation. So my marginal cost for using these two terabytes is basically zero, right? I, it doesn't cost me anything. I'm not buying a, a new disk in order to use Space Mesh. And the idea is that because the marginal cost is low for a lot of people, then they'll be able to join the, the mining uh, system. And what we'd like to see is not that there are no whales, but that there's a long tail. So there may be a few whales, but there are also a lot of people that uh, are small. And the, the long tail means that if we take sort of the, the sum of all the, their storage, it actually comes out to be a, a large fraction of the total system. And Again, we, this is nothing that we can guarantee, but this is like how the, we hope the, the the system will develop, and you know we're doing our best in terms of the design to to help that happen. So you're making the assumption here that people have computers with you know, presumably a lot of unused disk space, and that these computers are on and connected to the internet all the time. This is, I mean, it's not an assumption, but yeah, if for for this long tail to work, then you need a lot of people that have this, uh, are willing to have a, or maybe, you know, they already have a computer connected to the internet and uh, a lot of unused disk space. Okay. But so there's a sort of trend that, you know, most people now, I guess like professionals, I mean, I don't know anybody who has a desktop computer. Like most people that I know and myself, you know, have had laptops for years that are you know, on parts of the day, but mostly like, you know, off or in a backpack or like, you know, shut down or even, uh, in in sort of emerging uh, economies, most people don't even have a computer; they're using a mobile. Um, you know, as this trend continues, and less and less people are using desktop computers, and there might be like a you know a, a significant margin, but still like margin uh, of people who are using desktops. As this trend continues, would space mesh continue to work then? Or yeah, so it, like you know, in the worst case, suppose there are only a thousand whales, right? Space Mesh still works. It's not that you know Space Mesh will crash. Our security assumption is that there's an honest majority, right? Bitcoin right now is like super centralized, right? And it looks like it's still working. The, the reason you want this highly, we, we want it really for two reasons. One is sort of this general fairness where we do want you know, the you know, like everyday people to be able to join the system. But uh, the second one, sort of the, the, I think the most critical one for any cryptocurrency, even if you don't care about fairness, is you want uh, your, your security depends on having an honest majority. And the, the more centralized you are, the less reasonable this assumption becomes. So if we have, you know, 800,000 miners of which, you know, 400,000 are, uh, or maybe, you know, 700,000 have a majority, then 
making like colluding between 700,000 people is going to be really, really hard. So, so this honest majority assumption becomes a lot more reasonable. If you have 10 miners and they hold you know, the whole system, then it's a lot more iffy. And, but there are lots of you know, medium spaces. If you have 1,000 miners, they're all very big, then maybe it's already fine in terms of like uh, your trust in the system. Um, it's, it's not something like technically there's no reason space mesh can't work with two miners, right? The same reason Bitcoin can work with two miners. It's just, do you trust that, you know, if there are only two miners, the system actually has an honest majority? Okay, I see. So, um, walk me through the process. So I actually have two terabytes of unused disk space on a computer that is permanently connected to the internet. What, I, what do I do now? So again, you, you will be doing this uh, once, uh, our, uh, testnet uh, launches, right, or mainnet, depending, you know, how, how uh, adventurous you are. Um, so you download the, the Space Mesh client. And the first part is going to be filling your disk. So this part actually requires a proof of work. Um, I think the exact parameters aren't set yet, but think of something like, you know, two days of your computer working uh, and using your GPU and actually solving proofs of work to fill your disk. Um, and then once these two days are up, the, your, the, the space mesh uh, miner goes into the background and it just listens to the gossip network and trades, you know, sort of like a full node on, on Bitcoin. Um, and once every two weeks, your uh, node is going to create a proof of space time or actually a version of it that we call a NIPS, a non-interactive proof of space time. And it's going to do this by basically reading your whole disk. So once every two, two weeks, you have to read two terabytes. So that could take you, I don't know, half an hour once every two weeks. Um, and then it publishes something that we call an activation transaction, which contains this proof. This is, uh, you know, everybody receives this, it becomes part of the uh, block mesh. And at the, at the time you publish this activation transaction, it makes you active for the two weeks after. So we divide time into periods of two weeks that we call epochs. And so you publish something today, it means you're active in the next epoch. And the, the sort of one of the interesting things here is that when you publish your activation transaction, you basically already know when you're going to be eligible to generate blocks in the next epoch. So it's deterministic. It's not a, it's not a lottery at all, right? If you published an activation transaction, and it's not, it's not like, uh, you know, you have to, uh, you might get lucky and solve it. Or like if you stored something for two weeks, then you can generate an activation transaction. If you generated one and published it, then you will generate at least one block in the next step. Interesting. So that, that is completely unlike, uh, say, the Bitcoin or the Ethereum network, where people actually, uh, where miners uh, band together to, uh, to, to, um, into mining pools in order for, for, for people to actually generate uh, some reward every now and then, right? Right. So, so I think this is a very interesting property and actually also really helps with this uh, decentralization because it, it's no longer... In, uh, rational to join a mining pool, basically, right? Because mining pools usually join because you want to get rewards more often and you know, more um, with lower variance, so in a steadier schedule. But now you're basically guaranteed you get rewards once every two weeks uh, and you know, the, there's no probability about it. The, the probability comes in sort of when within these two weeks you're going to be generating a block. So, so there is some randomization, but the fact that you're going to be generating a block and that it will be accepted is guaranteed. So, so um, am I going to uh, be allowed to generate one block regardless of how much disk space I commit, or is it a linear uh, relationship? Okay, so, so there's sort of you know, two answers to this question. Um, it, it is linear. So basically, uh, the moment that the, the way we think of it is every unit of disk space, which I think we're setting at least initially to be something like uh, 250 gigabytes, but you know this, these are various system parameters are you know tweakable, and part of the the reason we're doing a test net is so we can you know play around with them and see what works best in, in various uh, situations. Um, but let's think of it right now as say 250 gigabytes. So so if you have two terabytes, you have uh, you know four units, and each unit is basically behaves like a virtual. 
uh, minor. So you get you know four times uh, four blocks in every epoch. Um, but we do have optimizations so that you know if you're generating uh, so if, instead of generating four different activation transactions with four different proofs, you only need one. If you generate multiple blocks in the same time period, then you can sort of, in terms of the communication, in terms of the computational complexity, you can just use one and just say that this is actually represents four, right? So, so there are various optimizations to make this more reasonable, but in terms of the reward you get, if you have four times the disk space, you had four times the reward. Okay, I see. So let's let's go into, so basically, as it's becoming already um, apparent, um, there'll be a lot of blocks generated, which kind of does not go together w well with um, the notion of a standard blockchain. And we'll get to that in a bit. But um, let me ask you first. So um, how how does um, how does the protocol make sure that I've actually saved the data on my disk for this amount of uh, time? So how how if if I say I've saved this for two weeks, um, how does it know I've actually saved it for two weeks and I didn't just put it there yesterday? Okay, that's that's a great question. So there are actually two parts to this. Um, the first part is what we call the proof of space time, which proves that I'm still storing um, the data. So basically. Uh, a proof of space time has sort of two phases. Uh, a first phase, which we call initialization, is this is what we said about working, the proofs of work. So you fill your disk with proofs of work, right? This is the first phase. This is something you only do once, right? So even though you, there is a proof of work involved, if you keep running the same system for many years, you only did the proof of work once and the rest of the time is just storage. Now, the second part of the proof of space time is uh, what we call the execution phase. So every two weeks, you're going to get a challenge. We'll speak in a second about how this challenge is computed. But it's supposed to be something that you couldn't predict. So you don't know in advance what this challenge is going to be. And in order to answer this challenge, you either have to have the proofs of work on your disk, or you have to work again to recreate them. But the thing is, even though you could do everything with proof of work, it's going to be a lot cheaper to store things, right? So honest users will basically just store things and prove that they still have them. Um, and how do you make sure that I can generate this data ex ante? So how okay. do you make sure that this excellent time question. has actually lapsed? Right. So this is, this is an excellent question. This brings us to the second part. So how do I, I know that I didn't just you know get challenges ahead of time or who, who generates the challenge, right? So if, if I know that this challenge, I couldn't have predicted it two weeks ago and you know, two weeks have passed and now I have it, then it proves that I've you know, stored this data for two weeks. Uh, or recreated it, but again, this is going to cost more than storing it for two weeks. So the way we do, we generate the challenge is we use a proof of sequential work. And uh, basically, a proof of sequential work is our proxy for elapsed time. So we also call it a proof of elapsed time. The reason is that it's, uh, you know, even though with a lot of hardware you can speed up parallel work, if you have to do sequential work, then the cost of speeding it up is much, much higher. And, and there's some things we just don't know how to speed up that, that well. So what you do is you, you do enough sequential work that it should take you about two weeks. Um, and the, the idea is that you use the, uh, a previous uh, proof of space time as your challenge to this proof of sequential work. And then you have to work two weeks. And then the output of this uh, sequential work is the challenge to the execution phase. And because it takes me two weeks, then I couldn't have predicted it two weeks ago. I had to have stored the data for two weeks. So this proof of sequential work takes me two weeks to produce, um, but it runs at a fairly low intensity, or how is it better okay, that, than that's, the conventional yeah, the, the other thing I wanted to work. say is this also seems to bring us back to proof of work, right? So why, if everybody's running a proof of sequential work, everybody's running a proof of work. So the nice thing here is that we don't care who generates this proof of sequential work because you're not proving that you did work. You're just proving that time elapsed. And so it's enough that somebody in the whole network does a proof of sequential work. One person can do it for everyone. So instead of having everybody run their own proof of sequential work, what we're planning is to have uh, servers on the network provide this as a service um, for, and because it, it scales, right? So it costs you you know, one CPU for, um, you know, two weeks, not that big a deal. If, you know, 100,000 people are all paying, they can pay like less than a cent and you recover your, your cost. So 
the, the more people sort of join this server, the, the cheaper it is. Basically, this means you don't have to trust the server because the proof is you know, self-certifying, but there don't have to be many servers. So we don't think that people will run their own servers. You know, the, there will be very few uh, people who run this server. They have like a fast computer and you'll, maybe you'll use two of them just in case, but, uh, but the idea is that you're just going to get this proof of sequential work. There'll be one proof for, uh, or maybe you know, a, a small number of proofs for the entire network. Okay, so I have this proof of sequential work now together with um, my uh, a pr a proof of space time, and that I can submit um, to to be allowed to mine a block. Is that correct? Yeah. So so this you submit in order to create your activation transaction. Mm -hmm. And now once you have an activation transaction, we know that you are active, right, in the next epoch. And there are also some. Uh, there's, there's an extra thing there. You have sort of this uh, public key that you publish as part of this activation transaction. And uh, part of this public key uh, lets you, it's a public key for a VRF, a verifiable random function. And this together with uh, your the, the sort of the epoch number and some other uh, details tells you sort of when in the next epoch you're going to be eligible to create a block. I'd like to come back to the this idea that most honest users will store the the data on their hard drive rather than do mm -hmm. the work. Now, if if the coin itself, if the asset becomes you know, incredibly valuable, mm -hmm. and and so sort of economically, if it starts making sense for people to do the work uh, rather than do the you know store store the data on their hard drive. You know, is is that possible? And is there so, uh, okay. a way to fix yeah, that? There, there's a good Otherwise, we just get back to proof of work. You're right. That's that's a great question. So, um, first of all, it you know, in terms of CPU versus storage, right? If it's uh, the cost of the coin doesn't really come into it, right? Because if the storage is cheaper, right? I, it's not like I get more coins by doing CPU versus storage, right? So. I, I'm always, I wanted to have the, the lowest costs to get the same reward, right? So you, the reward is, you know, a, every activation transaction gets X reward. And now if CPU costs me $10 and storage costs me uh, $1, I'd rather use storage. And the fact that the coin, if the reward goes up 10 times, I'd still rather use storage. I just get more reward. But it could be that um, the cost of CPU goes down, right? Or the cost of storage goes up, or like there, there's so many people are mining space mesh that you know there, there's a shortage of storage in the whole world, and everything becomes more expensive. It could also be that there's like a competing coin that uh, also uses a similar protocol, and that you know you would want to be able to sort of mine both coins, and so one you would do the actual like storing the data on your hard drive, and the other you would do the proof of work. Okay, but again, this is right. The proof of work is more expensive, so it's always you know it's going to be cheaper if if we build things correctly for, for to do to use storage rather than work. If you want to do two things, just get more storage. It's still cheaper than doing more work. But uh, the way we we handle the cases where the storage actually gets more expensive than the CPU. Right? Remember, we're talking about like a two week period. And um, there's also something that that I haven't said. So. We said there's a two week period, every miner gets a block. So what if there are you know, 7 million miners? Suddenly there are so many miners, the communication costs balloon. So once we get, I think, above around 800,000 miners, um, then either we have to let the communication costs go up or we can increase the epoch size. Right? So we can say instead of a two week epoch, we'll have a one month epoch. Right? Now we can handle twice as many miners with the same communication costs. But now the storage costs twice as much because you need to store something for a month instead of for two weeks. And so if before the storage um, maybe was less expensive storing something for two weeks than doing the, the work, now you know, the storage is twice as expensive. You're storing it for twice as long. So maybe suddenly it's not less expensive. So this is the space-time version of difficulty. Exactly. So, so in this uh, proof of space-time, there is a difficulty. What I said is we we fill your disk actually with proofs of work. So we have a very easy knob to turn. We can make these proofs of work just more difficult. And this says how hard it is 
to recreate the table. And one nice property that we have, so there, there are these uh, sort of, uh, com I don't know if competing, older versions called proofs of space, which uh, you know, the difference between proofs of space and proofs of space time is like this technical definitional thing, which uh, you know, if, if you want to know why I think the proofs of space time is correct, read, read the paper that's on ePrint. But in terms of the constructions, their constructions actually are also proofs of space time in some sense, but they don't have this difficulty adjustment. So they have some, some other advantages, but they have this big disadvantage where if I want to make the initialization harder, so it makes it, it basically make sure it still is rational to store rather than to use CPU, then in their case, you also have to make the verification harder, you have to store more, you have to do something to make it uh, that doesn't work quite well. And in our case, we can actually just you know, go over the proofs of work and make them harder. This episode of Epicenter is brought to you by Cosmos, the internet of blockchains. Cosmos is live and we couldn't be more excited to see so many projects already building on it. Blockchain technologies are evolving fast and development shouldn't be one size fits all. As a dApp developer, you need the tools that will allow your dApp to scale, grow and evolve over time. The Cosmos SDK is a user-friendly modular framework which allows you to customize your dApp to best suit your needs. It's powered by Tenement Core, an advanced implementation of the BFT proof of stake protocol. Cosmos takes care of networking and consensus and allows you to focus on building your application in your language of choice. Ethereum smart contracts will be supported soon, and the SDK makes it simple for you to connect to other blockchains in the Cosmos network. If you have an idea for a dApp and would like to learn more about the Cosmos SDK, or if you'd like to connect your existing dApp to Cosmos, visit cosmos.network epicenter. For Epicenter listeners, the Cosmos team will reach out to answer your questions and help you get started. We'd like to thank Cosmos for their support of Epicenter. I had another uh, question here with regards to possibly attacking the network. And of course, this kind of maps on to the idea of a 51% attack, but I don't know if, if it makes sense here. So maybe okay. uh, enlighten me on this. So in, in, the terms of, in terms of Bitcoin, at some point, it doesn't make any economic sense to use uh, old hardware. So that's why people are constantly upgrading their hardware because the old hardware is not in right. energy efficient and the newer hardware also produces more hash uh, hashes. Um, but with storage, you know, it's just storage. So someone could literally just buy up, you know, old hard drives that are being, you know, discarded from say like institutions or like school systems or like, you know, like there's like an abundance of old cheap like near zero cost hard drives out there that one could amass and build like a massive raid uh with all these hard drives and just keep adding hard drives and hard drives at basically no cost without having to buy new uh, storage space how would one prevent like like a sort of 51 percent attack okay so first of all it's uh there's not it's not no cost right there are two costs one is the initialization cost actually requires proof of work so adding this space does cost you an initial work, which means that it's going to be pretty hard to add, you know, a huge amount of space very quickly. Although again, it could be doable. The second thing is that, you know, when you say zero cost old drives, there actually is a cost. I think we we did some like, you know, back of the envelope calculations, and in terms of like the, actually getting things in production and, and doing something that works, it's not clear that it's actually cheaper to use old drives because they keep failing, because there are a lot of operational costs around using old drives that might not make it, like, again, I'm not saying that it, it doesn't work, but it is a big cost. It's, it's definitely not zero. Um, and the second thing is, could it work? Somebody with a large enough budget can always attack any of these systems, right? If you have, uh, a large enough uh, CPU budget or just, you know, cash. You can buy enough ASICs, you can attack Bitcoin, right? So right now for Bitcoin, this budget needs to be enormous because Bitcoin has a lot of budget already in operational. If you're talking about a smaller cryptocurrency, right, no matter what kind of cryptocurrency it is, because you can trade resources, money for resources, right? If it's proof of stake, if it's proof of work, if you have a large enough budget, you can buy 51%. So... Is it reasonable that you can buy 51% of, of the you know, space time in the system? I don't know. It depends on how big it is. But I'm sure in the beginning, it's not so hard, right? So if we just start, main, the, I don't know, it's $20 million. Yeah, if you have $20 million, you can you know, 
take over the system. Uh, one of the nice properties of proof of space uh, time versus uh, proof of stake is that even if you did capture the system, over time as the storage grows, right? So suppose you, you captured it now, you have $20 million and you captured you know, 90% of the storage. But in 10 years will be you know, $1 trillion. If you didn't continue investing and you didn't invest you know, $500 billion in those 10 years, you no longer have uh, 51%, right? You've been diluted. And there's nothing you can do to prevent that except you know, continually buy more resources. And right in that case, you know, there's nothing we can do. If, if, and nothing I, that I know of that any cryptocurrency can do. When, if you have enough resources to always have 51%, then right, this is the basic assumption of security for all of these systems. Okay, I have I have one last question about the security um, of this uh, proof of space time before we move on to the mesh. Just in very practical terms. So basically you say I, I have those two terabytes on my hard drive and I fill them with, with your proofs of work. Um, and uh, then basically this uh, a proof of elapsed time happens and uh, depending on that, um, I get asked questions of um, what's in position 1,713 and what's in position five and what's in position uh, 5,800,000, right? So, and basically which positions I'm being asked about depends on this proof of um, proof of elapsed time or the proof of consecutive work. And um, it has an element of randomness, right? And, um, and uh, actually making randomness on a uh, digital system is incredibly hard. So how, how do you go about that problem? This randomness is not so hard to generate because here we don't need like true uniform randomness. We just need unpredictability. And the proof of sequential work basically guarantees us unpredictability because if you could predict what the result of this proof of sequential work was, you could solve it faster than two weeks, right? So just by the fact that it is a proof of sequential work, it means that you cannot you know, guess the result before two weeks are up. Um, and we use this together with hash function, so in our case, say SHA-256, which in terms of our theoretical analysis, we pretend this hash function behaves like a completely random function. So obviously it doesn't behave like a random function, right? It's, it has these very you know, structural properties, but this is a very common assumption in practical cryptographic protocols. And even though in theory, like you can build these toy protocols that will work with a random function, but will not work with any actual hash function, in practice, we don't know how to break any of the protocols that are secure in what we call the random oracle model when you take the random oracle and replace it with SHA-256, right? So, so this, again, you know, it's not a total proof of security because it, maybe somebody will find some break in SHA-256, but if they do that, they will break so many other protocols that you know, this will be the least of our worries. <laughs> Okay, thank you. That makes uh, that makes complete sense. So let's move on to uh, the the mesh. Um, so as you alluded to earlier, um, you actually end up with a lot more blocks than you would um, on a typical blockchain. How is this handled uh, by the space mesh protocol? Yeah. So we're aiming for it, we we divide time into layers. So we we have a layer, say every five minutes. Again, the exact parameters might be tweaked, but this is like the current starting set. Um, and we'll have something like 200 blocks per layer. Again, this is randomized, so there might not be exactly 200. It depends who actually, you know, it's online and maybe some, some parties will not be online. They won't create a block. And there's also this randomization of when within the two week period you generate blocks. It could be just randomly that some layers are a little bit larger, some a little bit smaller, but this is uh, sort of on average. Um, this uh, 200 block uh, per layer gives us some very big advantages, and there are some disadvantages too. So uh, the big advantages are in terms of throughput, right? Now we can handle uh, a much higher throughput because uh, I guess this, this comes from two things. One is that because you're guaranteed that your block will get in, you don't have this huge disincentive to make your block larger, right? In Bitcoin, for example, if your block gets larger, it takes longer for the block to be transmitted which means that if somebody else uh, you know, solved the proof of work at the same time, their block will get in first. And so if you're in a race, 
then you want your block to be as small as possible. And this creates this perverse incentive where you don't want to put transactions in blocks um, because you want them to be uh, first in the race. And there's also these sort of limitations of the system where if you make the blocks too large, it will just take them too long to, to be transmitted, which means it will increase the chance of having multiple people solve uh, the proof of work at the same time or around the same time, um, which means that the security of the system actually breaks. So if you if you the time between blocks is too short, it's it's very short compared to the time it takes blocks to be transmitted over the network, then you're no longer guaranteed that you know the longest chain rule will will guarantee consensus. Okay, so basically, uh, large blocks and long propagation times they, they, they foster a high uncle rate. Exactly. But um, if you actually mine many blocks at the same time, how do you actually how do you deal with conflicting transactions that okay, will great. invariably be incorporated into all of these blocks? Right. So so this is where we come to the disadvantages. Um, so there are several disadvantages. Um, one of them is it's actually much harder to prove that you can get consensus because now we have to agree about sort of which blocks are the right blocks, the, the blocks in consensus, and which blocks are say say I published a block I pretended it happened you know uh, 200 uh, layers ago right so like it happened last week or something um, and maybe it even looks valid right because I said I'm guaranteed to to, to generate a block uh, in say layer 10 right and now several weeks have passed I generated the block I didn't publish it to anyone and now I, I publish it you know two weeks later. So it looks valid in terms of, you know, it, it was valid at the time. Had I published it, then it would be okay. So now we need to, to everybody to agree this is not part of our history, right? Because otherwise I could change history. So, so the main sort of challenges in designing uh, Space Mesh were exactly getting everybody to agree on exactly which blocks are considered part of the history. So those are blocks that we call contextually valid. Right, a block is contextually valid if it's sort of part of the real history. The, the transactions in this block are actually part of the history. And blocks that might be what we call syntactically valid. So they're, you know, they were generated in some sense correctly, but they weren't sent at the right time. Okay, so basically it's the, it's the distinction between proof of existence and proof of availability, right? I'm not sure I understood that, actually. <laughs> Okay, so basically, in in the Ethereum uh, space, uh, th that's also a very common common problem. Basically, there are two different, slightly slightly different problems. So one one is I have something and I want to be able to prove later that I had it at that point in time. So basically, what I can do is I can have a hash and I can post it to the blockchain, and then I can I can show you later that because I had the hash of this at this point of time, uh, a point in time, this is actually an incredibly strong proof that I actually had the ah, thing. Yes, at that okay, point okay, in time. I understand. So that's that. proof of existence, and basically proof of availability is that not only did I have the thing, but I also gave others access to this. Yes. Yeah. So, so exactly. This is the sort of questions we need to answer. And you can think of it like in Bitcoin, which is simpler, right? You have a block that, you know, solve the proof of work. It's syntactically valid, but only if it's on the longest chain, it's contextually valid, right? So by, by looking at the block itself, you can't tell if it's part of history unless you also see which other blocks point to it. So we have to do something similar in the mesh. But once we let's let's put that aside for a second, how we decide whether blocks are valid. Let's let's pretend for example for, for a second that we actually know. We have for each block, everybody agrees whether it's valid or not. We still have this case where people are publishing blocks at the same time, right? Like you said, and they might, you know, each see different transactions and the transactions might conflict. So in in a blockchain, we can sort of guarantee that if I'm publishing a block, all my transactions will never conflict. The transaction in my block will never conflict with something in a previous block or within themselves. But in a mesh, you cannot guarantee that. And so basically, we, we need to sort of uh, say that we allow conflicts, at least of some types, right? If there's a conflict that happens because two blocks are in the same layer and they couldn't have known about each other, that's fine. They can both be still contextually valid blocks, but we have this... Uh, sort of state evaluator that decides what transactions are valid, or in the case of smart contracts, you know, what is the current state of the system after running the, the programs that are part of the, these transactions, it runs over all these transactions. If there are two conflicting transactions, say the first one will be valid and the second one won't. 
This is, I think, maybe even easier to see in the in the smart contract type system, right? So suppose you have a transaction that takes 100 uh, coins out of an account and another one that takes 100 coins out of an account and the account only has 100 coins in it. So you can execute both of them, right? The first one will take 100 coins out of the account. The second one, everybody will agree that it didn't manage to take the coins out of the account because the account was already empty. So how do you agree on the order of these of these blocks? Once we agree which blocks are valid, then actually agreeing on the order is very easy. We just need to have um, you know, a hard-coded mechanism. And so one, like our initial mechanism is we'll just sort the blocks by their ID, right? So that everybody that sees a block knows its ID, there's the hash of the block. And so now we all agree on the order of blocks within a layer. And we can uh, then take, say, the transactions within each block and the, the order of the blocks. Uh, but you know, you, this this does sometimes like there are various like subtle issues there with you know lotteries and things like that where you might not want people to be able to you know, make sure that their uh, transaction is first. And so this mechanism, how you decide order, we can switch it, right? We can just as, as long as everybody agrees on it, and you know this will be hard coded in the system. But as part of testnet, we might you know play around with different mechanisms. Um, and once we get to mainnet, there will be you know, a fixed mechanism. It could be the, the order of the blocks. It could be something that's a little bit more randomized, you know, that depends on exactly which transactions are there. And you know, it, then we, we do some random ordering based on that. But you know, this is sort of an easy problem to solve when everybody agrees what's there. Okay. And do you get the block reward regardless of whether your, your block is actually um, included in the final blockchain or not? No. So... What, what is guaranteed is that if you're uh, behaving honestly, then your block will always be included, right? It, it will always be contextually valid. And so you will, you will get a block reward for every contextually valid block. Um, but the only way that your blocks will not get in is if you're behaving dishonestly. So, so you know, you're guaranteed a block reward. So tell me, where does this... Hair and tortoise protocol, these consensus protocols that you describe in the uh, paper, um, how did they fit into this? And you know, when at which point are you re using the hair protocol, and at which point are we using the tortoise protocol? Yeah. So, so maybe I'll, I'll, the, the high level, the tortoise protocol basically gives us a consensus and irreversibility. So basically, it makes sure that eventually everybody will agree on which blocks are valid, and also that if we agree, you know, and we have high confidence that, you know, some block in the past is valid, then it will stay that way, right? History can't be changed. And we call it the tortoise protocol because it's slow but steady, right? It, it will guarantee eventually consensus for everyone. It requires very few assumptions to work. Um, but it, uh, it takes a while. So consensus might take many layers. And the hair protocol comes in basically what the tortoise protocol guarantees, I'll get into maybe in a minute how it does this, but it guarantees that if all the honest parties start out agreeing, then very quickly they come to a confident consensus. And very quickly means within you know, one layer if there's no attacks and on average two layers if, if there are attacks. So we, we come to a, to a confident consensus very quickly, but only if all the honest parties start out agreeing. So why wouldn't they start out agreeing? Because the adversary um, might publish blocks that are sort of on the threshold between being on time and not being on time. Right? So honest parties will always you know, publish their blocks at the beginning of the layer. They know ahead of time exactly which layer is supposed to be the layer which they publish. They can create them ahead of time. They can publish. So it's always easy for them to sort of to, to work right. And the layers are far enough apart that you know all the honest parties will receive all the honest blocks for sure from one layer to the next. But if I'm trying to, to make consensus hard, then I can generate a block and then I'll publish it just you know half a minute before the end of the layer. And now some of the honest parties will get it and some won't. And maybe I can sort of fine tune the exact timing so that like whatever fraction I want, so half of the honest parties will think it's valid and half will think it's won't. It's not. Or you know, one third will think it's valid, one third will think two thirds will think it's not. So when this occurs, then the tortoise will eventually guarantee that we have reached consensus, but it will take longer. 
So we'll, we'll reach consensus quickly on honest blocks, but much slower on dishonest blocks. Um, and what the hair protocol does is it's basically a protocol that we run off chain. So we run it on the gossip network, but it's not part of the, the sort of final history. And it helps the honest parties agree right away about which protocol, uh, about which blocks are valid. So they're guaranteed that all the honest blocks will be considered valid. And these blocks that are in the middle, then they might be valid, they might not, but they will all agree on them. And so now the Tortoise Protocol will guarantee consensus very So you have instant finality on the clear-cut cases, whereas the um, whereas finality on not-so-clear-cut cases just takes longer. Yes, except that because we want to have a programmable system with smart contracts, it's not enough to just say, you know, this transaction is good. It actually... What it does depends on whether another transaction came in or not before it, right? So we actually need to have finality on an entire layer in order to say that we can now compute what the current state should be. And what the Hero Protocol does is guarantee very fast finality on the entire layer, even if, if there are some blocks that are uh, sort of maliciously generated and, and they're trying to prevent consensus. Okay, but that so th that was going to be my next question. So basically, what kind of transactions does does Space Mesh um, allow? Um, and you already said that you're aiming for smart contracts. Um, but does it mean that uh, basically the the reaction time of the network is five minutes or whatever one layer is? Yeah. So so the latency of the network is not fixed. It's probabilistic because it depends on how it's being attacked. You know, if if it's not being attacked which is probably going to be, or being attacked like with a you know, very small uh, percentage of the resources, then the finality is going to be around five minutes. So we'll be, uh, again, it depends on the parameters. So you know, don't uh, take me to five minutes, we'll, we'll play around with this. But yeah, I can be pretty confident in the results. And I think, again, we have this thing that's sort of like Bitcoin in the sense that you know, there's no final finality, right? There's just levels of confidence. So you know, if if you see something with one confirmation, then you know what the probability is that an adversary with this much resources can reverse that. If you see six, then the probability goes down, but there's never a zero. So we have the, the same type of guarantee, right? Uh, but it, it goes down very, very quickly. And because we have 200 blocks every time, and we have the same type of analysis as Bitcoin, right? The blocks are sort of voting for the, the previous uh, layers, then uh, we get it faster than Bitcoin, much faster. What are the useful applications do you anticipate here? Or you know, are you targeting a specific type of user or a specific type of applications for Space Mesh? Uh, no, so we actually are a very general purpose infrastructure. Um, obviously, you know, the, the initial use was probably going to be uh, payments because this is sort of what the current use of, uh, the main use of cryptocurrencies is in general. Um, but our, our infrastructure is planned to support basically anything, you know, dApps, uh, registries, you know, whatever we can think of, and especially whatever we cannot think of yet, but people will come up with. Okay. I, I mean, I think the main use for cryptocurrency at the moment is speculation, not, not okay, payments. Well, the, but, the, main, um, the main use that people talk about that, uh, you know, what it can do that right now we don't have good ways of doing uh, without it. Speculation, okay. yeah. Are you um, are you incorporating at least at the beginning or at some point? Are you thinking of having some sort of governance mechanism like on chain governance, or uh, is this? So I know in the paper there's mention of this foundation. You know, does yeah. the foundation so, play so a role here? Nothing. Uh, governance is it's it's a great question and it's something that you know we're actively working on. We know that it's something that we should have in place uh, at least an initial version of this uh, when we launch mainnet, but. You know, this is something that we're, we're looking at the, the options and what people are doing. We're talking about it. You know, if people have opinions about this, then, you know, we're, we're very happy to hear it because th things are not fixed yet at this point. Okay. And uh, so I realize this is not necessarily um, sort of your role, but can you talk a little bit about, you know, the team and, uh, you know, the, the funding that you've raised? And also, you know, if, if there's a business model here, uh, you know, maybe not at the moment, but sometime in the future, uh, how do you anticipate to make money as a company? Okay, so in terms of the team, so we're an open source project. Uh, we have about 20 people working uh, full time, um, of which uh, I think the, the vast majority are developers that are writing code. 
And we also have a, a, a research team, which consists of uh, the, the, the research team is basically all people in academia. So we're, we're all with uh, several hats. Um, so there's uh, me, there's uh, Ido Bentov, um, there's uh, Barak Shani, who did the PhD in New Zealand, worked on elliptic curves. Um, there's Julian Loss, who's uh, finishing his PhD now in uh, Bochum. And there's uh, uh, Tal Malkin, who's a professor at Columbia. So, you know, the, all people in academia. And we're also, you know, this is completely open project. We're happy to work with anybody in terms of research. Like as I said, I, I mentioned, uh, you know, the Christoph and Brahms work. Um, we're in, in academia, we're not competitors, right? We're, we're all trying to, you know, get the best technology out there. And we're building on, you know, whatever we find that's, that's the best uh, that we can use. In terms of the developers, um, they're an amazing development team. I think one of the critical things in terms of actually, you know, constructing a working protocol is having a, a development team that can, can do this. And I think it's quite rare to find people who can understand the theory deeply and are, you know, amazing uh, coders. And, you know, just as an example, they started working, I think, less than a year ago, and we already have a working protocol um, that and testnet is starting in, like, uh, I think, July. So, you know, th this is a very, very short time period for this kind of work, and it's definitely not a simple protocol. Um, so I, I'm, like, very impressed by the development team. You know, I've, I've worked with, with developers before, and they really impressed me. Um, in terms of, uh, of investments, so uh, we raised uh, initial seed round, um, I think, I don't remember exactly when, a year and something ago. And about six months ago, we had another $15 million investment from sort of the top tier um, blockchain and crypto funds like uh, Polychain, Metastable, Slow Ventures, a Collaborative Fund, and another seven additional you know, top tier funds. In terms of the business model, uh, the idea is that um, the the vast majority of the coins are going to go to miners, but there will be, at least in the initial period, um, a small amount of pre-mining, less than 10%, and uh, a tax, again, on a limited time period, a tax on the block rewards that will go to sort of uh, compensate development and the investors. This pre-mining, so I suppose you will have some of those coins, and you're sort of betting on the future value of, of, the, of exactly. the coin uh, and these transaction fees or sorry, uh, this transaction tax that you mentioned. It's a reward tax, not, a, not on transactions, but on the block rewards. On the block rewards. Yeah. So once this runs out, um, you know, what, what do you think is the future of the company? I mean, the investors that invested, uh, you know, almost $20 million in your company, I guess, are um, betting not only on the future value of the token, but also on the company itself. Uh, what what's the plan there? So again, uh, this is not like my area. I'm you know chief scientist in charge of the technical part, the research. Uh, so I'm not a hundred percent sure. As far as I know, um, the the main you know return for the investors is going to be uh, the value of the coin. So. It, we're not planning on doing anything uh, you know, more complicated. And also, we, we are ensuring that there isn't like a large block of coins that somebody holds ahead of time that can be used to manipulate markets and things like that. We're sort of dripping the coins off over time so that you know, to, to help it stay decentralized. Now, just before we wrap up, uh, please tell us a bit about the roadmap. So I, I know you mentioned there's a testnet coming up soon. And also where people can find Space Mesh, where they can read about it and learn more and maybe even get involved. Yeah, so actually we're, we're happy for people to get involved. Um, our website is spacemesh.io um, and you'll find links. It's a very cool website, by the way. It's Thank you. Very, yes, very cool. I, I also liked it. It's, uh, our our you know, chief marketing officer is also amazing. The, the website has links also to the testnet. So we're going to be launching testnet uh, in July. The if you want to get involved there, then definitely follow the links. There are various interesting things you, you can help with. If you're you know an amazing uh, coder, we're actually hiring people in New York. We want to build our current client is built in Go. We want to build an actual uh, completely separate implementation in Rust, so that we'll have you know something that can validate the spec. 
uh, and not rely on you know the the code is the spec. Um, in terms of uh, of roadmap, uh, you know testnet is going to run for at least uh, I think six months, uh, and mainnet we hope to get out by the end of the year. But you know the whole point of testnet is testing and, and finding bugs, finding problems. Um, we want the security to be you know, obviously we're writing security proofs uh, for everything we do. We, we um, want to make sure the protocols are sound, but that's not enough to guarantee security. So we're also going to have uh, bounties for finding bugs. Uh, we're going to run extensive testing. We're going to have code reviews. We're like we want to make sure the software is also secure. And you know, depending on what we find, uh, obviously this could cause uh, mainnet to be delayed. But ideally, it's going to be by the end of the year, and we'll start uh, you know, running active currency. Great, sounds very Good. exciting, and uh, yeah, it's a it's a it's a fascinating idea for consensus protocol. Uh, give my regards to uh, Aviv Al, who uh, is also on your team, and I know is a big fan of the show, and whom I've met before. So, I will. Thank you. Cool. We look forward to the test net. Thank you. We release new episodes of Epicenter every week. Click here to subscribe for hundreds of insightful interviews with some of the leading minds in blockchain and crypto. You can also listen to the audio version of the podcast on iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, and other podcast apps. Click here for a full list of places where you can listen. Thanks for watching Epicenter, and we hope you'll join us for our next episode.